Earlier this year, we talked about the infringement case between a man named Jonas Utica and the music artist Aaron Carter had allegedly used this very artistic piece of artwork. I'll, I'll let you form your own opinions. I, I think very highly of it. I think it's a very powerful, the heart-shaped two lions. You know, we always talk about like the two wolves. You have two wolves inside your head. One is a good wolf, one is a bad wolf. Which wolf will win the battle between the two wolves? Well, the one you feed. So it's a, you know, it's kind of a parable of sorts, you know, feed the good wolf and, and don't feed and starve the bad wolf. And here you've got kind of the two lions, not really at battle, but rather one representing sun and one representing moon. And, you know, the two of them together make up the heart or something. I'm sure you can all form your own opinion. And, and when someone then takes that piece of artwork and passes it off on their Twitter account, two lions at war can reach an understanding. I have my lion's den, you have yours, AaronCarter.com, hoodies are back up. All unreceived orders, contact Dawn in my contacts on my website. You can reach me directly. I, so if, if you're having fulfillment problems, you can contact Dawn is the, uh, the lesson of the day. No, um, if, if you are advertising your website and your sales of your merchandise, using these two lions, which obviously don't belong to you, you should have permission. You know, you really just can't copy paste someone's artwork. Now, the ironic or hypocritical thing here, in my opinion, is that Aaron Carter himself is a famous music artist. I believe he had a, a childhood music career back in the 90s, and I'm assuming that that popularity has earned him some level of following today. And I we went over in our previous video his reaction to this lawsuit, and it was, shall I say, not a mature reaction for someone who was a teenager in the 90s who should be what, in his 40s now, his early 40s? He's basically my age, I guess. Um, he really should have a more mature reaction to a pretty obvious situation. I mean, the parties haven't proved their case yet, but what ended up happening is Jonas Utica, I'm sorry if I'm getting the exact pronunciation wrong, but I'm trying to be close here, sued Aaron Carter back in August. This is August 31st of 2020. And the remarkable thing was that in October or something, around about the fall of 2020, Mr. Carter did not respond to the complaint in time, and that earns you a default by the clerk. The clerk of court will enter what's called a default. Now, a default and a default judgment are two separate things. First, the clerk enters the sort of technical default. When a party against whom judgment is sought has failed to plead or defend, and that failure is shown by the opposing party, the clerk must enter the default. And then there's two ways that you can get a default judgment. So default would be not responding. Default judgment would be the judgment of who owes who money or, or whatever is going to happen in the case. The clerk can enter default judgment if the plaintiff's claim is for a certain sum of money and that sum can be either computed or, or shown directly, the clerk with the plaintiff's affidavit showing the amount due must, must, which is a, you know, shall, must happen word, enter judgment for that amount with the costs against the defendant who has defaulted for not appearing. In all other cases, which this would be the other case because the copyright damages had to be calculated or a range of statutory damages had to be found. And there was later a dispute over whether statutory damages even applied. In all other cases, the party must apply to the court, the judge for a default judgment. They must uh, appear personally or through representatives, serve written notice, at least seven days before the default judgment hearing, the court may conduct further hearing, uh, preserve the right to the jury trial, or enter a judgment anytime these things happen. And then 
the judge can also set aside the default judgment for good cause, which is what's happened here. We have a order from Judge Dolly M. G. or Dolly M. G. I'm not sure how that's pronounced. Order denying plaintiff's motion for default judgment. On August 31st, plaintiff Jonas Utica filed a complaint alleging two claims of copyright infringement against defendant Aaron Carter. The clerk entered default against Carter October 7th, 2020. Utica now applies for the default judgment. The motion for default judgment was served on December 7th. The very next day, an attorney noticed his appearance, which means sent notice to the court, and filed a memorandum in opposition to the motion for default judgment, which I believe we went over that in our previous video. In the opposition, Carter's attorney indicated his intention to file a motion for relief from default. This is also called a motion to open the default judgment. Uh, so it, it would invalidate the default judgment and the case would go forward. Given Carter has appeared in this action to oppose the default judgment, the court exercises its significant discretion to consider whether there is good cause to set aside the entry of default judgment. Good cause like we saw here in Part C. In evaluating whether good cause exists, a court may consider these three factors. Whether the party seeking to set aside the default engaged in culpable conduct that led to the default whether it had no meritorious defense, or whether reopening the default judgment would prejudice the other party, these factors are disjunctive. Thus, a finding that any one is true is sufficient reason for the court to refuse to set aside the default. So, in my opinion, whether the party seeking to set aside the default judgment engaged in culpable conduct, not responding to the complaint to me, would be culpable conduct. Meritorious defense? I don't know that I see a real meritorious defense here, but sure, uh, if in its motion to reopen the default judgment it presented a meritorious defense, I, I guess so, but I don't really see a really meritorious defense here. He doesn't say, I had a license. He doesn't say, this is a fair use. This is clearly using the entire work, which is fair use number three, so it's it's he, the finding of fair use on, on factor number three would go against Aaron Carter. It's not transformative. It's using the artwork for the purpose that the artwork was made. Um, it's usurping the market for licensing the artwork. It's denying a license fee, whether even, even if it's a modest fee, to Jonas. So I don't see how there's a meritorious defense here, but okay. And then three, whether reopening the default judgment would prejudice the other party. That's probably the easiest to do away with because it probably isn't prejudicial to the case that the other party has. Maybe it's prejudicial in the sense that Mr. Utica has paid an attorney and, and now having done all of that work, reopening the default judgment means that some of that money is... is lost in the sense, but the court could grant the remedy of fee shifting later and order Carter to pay Utica for his attorney's fees in doing all that work. The court goes on to say, nonetheless, so despite what the law says, <laughs> default judgment is a drastic step, appropriate only in extreme circumstances. A case should, whenever possible, be decided on the merits. And I do believe that a case should be decided on the merits and not on a technicality. But these were sophisticated parties. Mr. Carter wasn't confused by the lawsuit. He just didn't respond to it. And honestly, for such a what looks like an open and shut case, it should have been resolved on default judgment. All that we would have to have is a damages hearing, and then the court would enter the damages as a judgment and Carter would pay. It's probably not a huge judgment. The plaintiff, Jonas Utica, has not, as far as I remember, proven what the damages actually were. If we don't even really know if statutory damages applied or if actual damages applied because there was some dispute over when the copyright was registered. If it was registered in time and then the infringement was considered to be after the date of the 
uh, of, of that registration. And, and I believe there's also some case law and, and the law says something about if you register within 30 days of infringement, you can get statutory damages. Then, then you get statutory damages and attorney's fees. But big dispute, if you don't register in time, you only get actual provable damages and no attorney's fees. No, no attorney's fees and court costs. So there's a incentive there to register your copyrighted works. And, and then it gets into an access to justice problem because a lot of us don't make even the copyright statutory or even the copyright registration fee on our videos. Many of my videos that only get like eight or 10,000 views, we get 50 or 60 bucks. Sometimes they go a little bit viral and we'll make a couple hundred dollars. And that's really, that's great. I mean, I'm, that, that's an incentive for me to create better content and I'm fine with that, but uh, it means I can't afford to register every single work that I make. I would end up having a monetary loss if I registered every every work that I made. So I don't have that level of statutory protection on every work that I make because of the costs involved. And that's an access to justice problem, but I'm, I'm digressing here. The court concludes that the circumstances do not warrant the extreme measure of entering a default judgment, even if Carter acted in bad faith by not promptly responding to the complaint. He did appear in this action to defend himself immediately upon being served with the motion for a default judgment. His opposition states potentially meritorious defenses. I you've got two questions here. You've got the first question up or down, yes or no, was there copyright infringement? I don't see the meritorious defense to that. So I'm not sure that it's what the court is saying here, that it presents meritorious defenses. I, I don't like that. Unless the judge is thinking the actual versus statutory damages is the meritorious defense. And I think the judge has the discretion to hold that default judgment hearing on damages and cover the actual versus statutory damages issue. So you can have like a half a trial instead of having to have a full trial. And so I think that would have been judicially efficient, but sure, the judge is trying not to be biased against the defendant and enter judgment without letting them present a defense, whatever that defense may be. So the judge says these factors and the court's preference. So the court is basically exercising its discretion. The judge is saying, eh, yeah, maybe I could be a jerk in either direction, you know, either a jerk against Aaron Carter or a jerk against Jonas Utica. I'm going to favor the adjudication on the merits. And therefore that weighs in favor of setting aside the default judgment. The court therefore orders the clerk to set aside Carter's default, denies the motion for default judgment, and Carter shall now file an answer within 15 days of this order, May 19th, 2021. You might remember that we, I did this same sort of thing when we had the case, the Imagos case against Alex Maurer. Ms. Maurer did not respond after the court's two month deadline. And I immediately motioned for a default judgment. And the judge was like, no, get the heck out of here. I'm not defaulting a pro se party for being three days late in their filing, especially when she responded right after I motioned for default judgment. So the same thing, uh, the judge yeah, could have had the discretion to find in favor of the plaintiff, Mr. Utica, or Imagos in my case, but the judge prefers, and the courts generally prefer, an adjudication on the merits. And one of the points I really wanted to make with this, this is not good for the parties. This is a fairly simple dispute. The dispute is really about this use, was it infringement and what's the damages? And now the parties are going to have to go through the full litigation process. Mr. Carter not responding and getting default, whether it was intentional or a mistake, that was somewhat judicially efficient. He doesn't seem to have a really great defense to this infringement. If he let it go to a default judgment and then just simply fought the thing on the amount of damages, you only need to pay for that fight on damages, 
maybe a little bit of discovery. Maybe you have to make a motion before the judge to reopen the discovery just for exchanging information about the damages. Mr. Carter is going to want to know what Jonas Utica typically sells his artwork for, especially if it's an actual damages case, if they're, if they're making the case for actual damages. Mr. Carter is going to want to know uh, more information as well. How many of these copies did he sell or what channels does he sell them through? Meanwhile, Jonas is going to want to ask questions to get Aaron to admit when and how he posted this and try to make the case that somehow statutory damages apply if statutory damages are higher. Because remember, statutory damages are limited to that one infringed work, whereas actual damages are limited to what can actually be proven. You might have two different numbers, and you might not always choose statutory damages. I've talked about this in the H3H3 update number three, because Triller Fight Club might want to go with actual damages. If there were a million unauthorized views of the fight, if, big if, but if there were, Statutory damages isn't going to count views, it's going to count how many works were infringed. And yes, the views will come into the calculation of, of how high the judge should assign statutory damages, but the judge is limited to $150,000 per title. So a million unauthorized views of a $50 per viewer or per, per I don't know, it's not always one viewer, you might purchase one view and your family might watch it in the privacy of their own home. I don't know how legal that is or not, but even if a million views is $50 per viewer, the statutory damages would be limited to 150,000 plus attorney's fees and costs. So if you can prove actual damages, you, the plaintiff, then elect actual damages, get $50 per view, try to convince the judge that the damages are $50 million, which is, I think, where Triller is getting the $50 million figure from, that it's a million plus views at $50 per view. I, I don't think that's going to be what they actually recover, but that's the strategy that you would use. So now, instead of Aaron Carter and Jonas Utica just having a fight over whatever the damages are, they have to put that fight on hold and they have to have a fight over was it infringement in the first place. They have to have the whole trial uh, from beginning to end, the whole litigation process, not just the trial. The trial comes at the end. But they have to have the discovery of evidence, scheduling order for setting all the dates for everything. They have to get their evidence built into the record and have the fight over what's relevant evidence and what's not, what's allowed in, what's not. They have to do that exchanging of discoverable information. They have to make a motion. Somebody will make a motion for summary judgment if that's applicable, which it sounds like it would be in what I'm considering a, an open and shut case. And then you have a trial if you can't get the thing resolved on summary judgment. And that's just on the question of whether this is copyright infringement, not on the question of damages. Then you get to have a whole second mini litigation and mini trial on what the damages are and whether actual or statutory damages are um, appropriate for this case. So that's not a good situation. I don't know how the parties are with their resources and fortitude for litigation. Um, maybe Mr. Utica is prepared to pay for all that litigation. Maybe Mr. Carter is as well. I, I don't really know how the parties are situated financially, but you could imagine where one party tires financially of litigation or tires personally of litigation. So it's also completely possible that these two parties through their attorneys could work out some number and settle the case saying that we've got a very simple situation here that doesn't really need to have 40 or 50,000 sort of minimum dollars in litigation thrown at it from each side when the actual damages are probably closer to a couple hundred to a couple thousand dollars. Maybe statutory damages are a couple thousand dollars. The other thing that they had that they have here in the complaint, you see here, there's no attribution. So there is a law 
17 U.S.C. 1202, which requires attribution. So removal of copyright management information, which I can't seem to highlight here. There we go. So removal of information called copyright management information, which is the personally identifying information about the user of a work or copy. So this would be the, it's basically the author's attribution. If you remove that, there's also a damages calculation which is $2,500 to $25,000 in statutory damages. So that could be part of the lawsuit now, and indeed it is. Count three is the removal of copyright management information. Count two is contributory infringement, and count one is direct infringement. So yeah, we're going to get to either see a settlement between these parties, or we will have an all-out knock out, drag, knock down, drag, drug out. I can't say it, but you know what I mean. Fight between these two parties over <laughs> the two lions use, which I think is just, this is one of the dumbest fights I've ever heard. Not that Mr. Utica is wrong, but rather that Aaron Carter, his reaction was very strong. He, his reaction was very strong and very immature. I believe he said some nasty things which I think are listed here. You should have taken it as a compliment, expletive. A fan of mine sent this to me. Oh, here they go again. The answer is, no, this image has been made public and I'm using it to promote my clothing line. I guess I'll see you in small claims court. And then he misspells the F word. It was a admission that I think his lawyer is going to have a hard time overcoming that admission. Admissions against interest are not hearsay, so somebody can testify to have a plaintiff can testify to having seen this. Admissions against interest become part of the record and then can be used against you. So I don't I don't see how this is anything but an open and shut claim. But the effective registration date of the Brotherhood illustration was March 23rd, 2020. And this publication is 17 January 2020. So we're going to have a fight over whether the infringement occurred separately after March 20th, 2020. And if it did not, and if that 30-day registration window applies and it was not registered within the window, then Mr. Utica is not getting statutory damages and attorney's fees, which will change the strategy for the plaintiff in this case. Let me know what you think of that and the news that the case will be going forward after all in the comments below. And that's our show. Thanks for joining me. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and this is Lawful Masses, your favorite legal news and education program here on YouTube, also on Floatplane and on twitch.tv slash lawful masses live on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern time. This is a community supported channel, which means I need your money. It takes time and effort to make these videos. And in order to make room in my life, I need to also have support so i really appreciate your support on patreon.com slash lj french or sponsors.com slash law you can support the channel through youtube memberships or you can support the channel through float plane subscriptions thank you very much in the month of may to the following 50 dollars plus supporters joe tyson john Steele, gavin barnard ev spirit bear benjamin hytoff ugly grill rudolph Bescherer jr brandon abel torpedon rdh dragon earthbound star and shadow tycho and thank you to the five dollar plus supporters who are scrolling on the screen in front of me you're all on the led tablet behind me i love you all thank you for joining me i'm leonard french i'll see you in the videos that drop and the comments below